somewhat mildness before the real cold sets in. November, right? Gonna happen. <laughs> so I had to throw that out there. Uh, good, good to be together today at the fellowship and just encourage one another. You turn with me to, I'm just gonna have to turn to a passage. We're gonna get to it here uh, pretty soon. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm going to read that in a couple of moments here, um, verses 20 through 26. Uh, but uh, you know, when I look at uh, the scripture, when I look at you know, Jesus' life, how he was connected to his Father. Uh, a passage that I've uh, kind of been reading lately and kind of been coming back to and just felt my heart that was something that uh, we needed to you know, look at. That's for the fact that uh, Jesus prayed for himself, for his disciples, and for our believers. Prayer was huge for, for Jesus. We know that uh, throughout uh, his life, he took time to walk in solitude uh, with the Father. Took time to go praying. Prayer was very, very important to, to Jesus. Very important. And if you look and see all that Jesus went through, uh, all just the pain and the agony and the uh, the hardships that he went through, it was important that he connected with his Father. It was very important that he connected um, and refueled his spirit and refueled himself. He was connected. Uh, time and time again, he just he goes to the Father to, uh, to recharge, often withdrew. And we know that when he withdrew, people came after him. Where are you going? We need you. <laughs> you know, Jesus was very needed, uh, but he needed, and most of all, to connect with God the Father. I'm going to read to you uh, the main text today, John 17, verses 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me, given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may, may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Those are, that's a powerful prayer. And what's even, uh, you know, if you back up a couple of sections here, to begin John chapter 17, Jesus prays for himself, but it's not a selfish prayer. He's praying because he knows that all authority has been given to him, and that he is in charge of leading these men that he called together, that he created such a bond with. He prays for them, and he prays for all of the believers. Jesus was very, uh, was, I mean, he, he was very um, uh, focused on prayer, because prayer was so important, connecting with God the Father. We see Jesus praying for the believers, praying for the believers that would come from the, the start of the early church and you and I today. He prayed for us. It's very clear that he believed strongly in prayer. It was vital in his relationship with God the Father. The two words that stand out in this passage uh, when I read this verse is found in verse 23. Every time I read this, verse 23 sticks out to me. Two words come out where he says, May they be brought to complete unity. I think that was first and foremost on Jesus' mind that all of us, all of people that would be a follower in the kingdom would be brought to complete unity. I mean, look at the disciples. Do you think they always got along? No. Do you think the people in the church always got along? No. Do you think we get along now? Not always. It's, it's been passed through, through the years, through the ages. We're a perfect people. Jesus knew that. He knew his men weren't perfect. And they needed to pray for. And we need to pray for. And just think about that word complete. Complete, not lacking anything. Complete is all together, all there, in unity. That's 
that's a big word for us. Being unified, unity, complete unity. And the prayer of complete unity is one of the most powerful and echoed prayers throughout the New Testament. I mean, it's, it's brought up time and time again when Paul talks to the different churches. I want, them, I want you to have unity. He talks about the problems. Get unified. Come on, love each other. Be there for each other. You know, Paul really harped on that. Maybe not really harped on it. Maybe in a way he harped on them, yes. But he encouraged them, saying, you got to have this love thing together. You need to be unified. That's what's most important. Jesus certainly desired that his passion for the people and the need for prayer would continue in our lives today, just as it did back then. Why do you think Jesus prayed so much for complete unity among the body of believers? Why was that so important to him to see lived out, not only among his disciples, but among the church as well? Why was that so important? And praying was huge, but it wasn't just the praying, it was praying for unity. You know, we forget that prayer is powerful, very powerful, and Jesus used it often. That wonderful things happen when we pray. And after reading through these prayers that Jesus lifted up for himself, the disciples, and the rest of the believers, it's apparent, and I hope that it is to you as well, that we certainly need to do a better job in our lives of striving for complete unity in the church. It's important. In many ways, we have become uh, a people set apart from unity for various reasons. And the world, uh, the world pressures have a lot to do with that. You know, we let ourselves become infected, uh, if you will, from the world. The pressures, attitudes, the enemy. He knows how to get us. He knows what buttons to push. He knows how to set us off to each other. And all through my years of growing up and being in the church and just being part of different congregations, it's everywhere you go. Satan gets in and he pulls apart whatever he can. Whatever you is there, he's after. He's after to pull apart. If you need already pulled apart, he's done his job. He is the enemy. He is the deceiver. He wants that to happen to us. You know, understand that I'm not just talking about this church, but the church as a whole, the body of Christ, God's family. Satan is after us. Church, Satan is on us all the time. Any way he can get in to cause strife, he will. And he's been doing that for a long time. It's not just in the last few weeks. It's not in the last few years. It's been happening since I was a kid growing up. It's been happening many, 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 many years. Ever since Jesus rose from the grave and conquered sin and death, the enemy has been on people, on people, on people. Happened in the beginning. <laughs> you know, with Adam and Eve. You know, he was present in the situation. He tries to attack and pull people down. He, he, he tries so hard to do that. We see mentioned throughout the throughout the New Testament, especially with the letters to the different churches, as I said before, that unity is something that needs regained in the church today. Paul was passionate about this, just as Christ showed his passion for unity. And we can see throughout the New Testament, all that Paul wrote to churches, keep the unity, and you know, various wording, keep the unity, keep the unity, keep the unity. He was passionate. He went from hurting the church to proclaiming the gospel. And he was bold in doing that. He wanted people to know that the church needed to be unified. If you turn with me back to Saul, back in the Old Testament, we're going to look at Psalm 133. Psalm 133, verse 1. Psalm 133, 1. How good and pleasant it is for brothers live together in unity. And if you look at the translations, you'll see that it's, it's talking about the, the believers as a whole. A lot of times in the scripture, sometimes it refers to uh, brothers. It's referring to the body of Christ. How good it is when the church strives for unity. When people, when God's family, God's children strive to be, unified, to be unified. Is it hard? Absolutely. Absolutely it's hard. The psalmist shares how wonderful it is. When there's unity. Will it, be, will it ever be perfect? I don't know if we'll ever be perfect at it. We have a lot of problems in that. But we certainly should strive to be as unified as we can. We're all one body serving Christ together. 
And that's a beautiful picture when it works well. And God does amazing and wonderful things when there's unity. Unity is the key. Is it hard? Many times it is. And why? Because we're all different. <laughs> and the enemy is lurking around trying to devour us. And he wants nothing more than to get the people in the church family uh, disrupted in any way possible he can. And he's good at it. He is very good at it. Sometimes we're, we're, we're getting into a selfish mode or negative mode, and it's just gradual. We don't even know. Satan got the football somehow, and he got in and is destroying relationships that we have. The Apostle Paul speaks um, about how the church body is made up of many parts that we should work together. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Excuse me. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. And there's many more passages that we go through. Uh, uh, we could get into another time, maybe a series. God and the church in different parts. You go down through the rest of, verse, uh, rest of the chapter 12. And it talks about arm, legs, and eyes. And they all work together. We are all to form one body. And when we work together, it's unified and it's beautiful. Um, I don't know if, how many of you like landscapes and sunsets and sunrises. Sunsets and sunrises just take me, I mean, they, they take my breath away. I see them a lot of times out here. You know, maybe it's in the morning or the evening. I'm driving and then it captures my attention. And I want to stop and take pictures. Why? Because they go quick. <laughs> You know, if you're taking a walk, you're like, well, maybe we can get up there and get, no. <laughs> when you get up there, it's gone. You have to find, you have to see the beauty quickly. You know, and that kind of beauty, you know, I just think God puts that beauty in our lives. And that's the beauty we can see when the church works together. You know, a beautiful scenery, a beautiful landscape, whatever it may be. Beauty. God loves for the church to work together, to be unified and beautiful. What the enemy wants is for us to nitpick, <laughs> to nitpick at different things we don't like about others, and uses that to stir problems. You know what? He's been doing that for years and years and years. It's not a new, it's not, oh wow, the enemy's doing that. We all know that. We all know that. It happens in our lives. We're perfect. We see that happening. But what do we do about that? What do we strive to do to make sure that that doesn't happen? It's been happening for so long in the church. And the question that I want to pose here for all of us is, where's my effort? Ask yourself that question today. Where's my effort in this? Don't worry about somebody else. Don't worry about, well, they're doing that. Figure it out in your life. Because you can't control other people as much as you want to sometimes, as much as we would like to, you know, Yank people out of whatever mode they're in. Some people want to yank us out of the mode we're in. We can't control others, okay? All we can do is, is, is work on us with the help of God, of course. Working on us. Where is my effort? Where is my effort? It's the question we all need to ask as we examine our motives and examine whether or not we're putting any effort into our part of the body of Christ. And that may sound kind of harsh, but there's times when we just have no desire to contribute. We're in our own world. We're selfish. Uh, people throughout Scripture dealt with that, being selfish. And we need to come back to the focus, being unified, working together, working hard to be loving together. All of us are selfish in one way or another, and that needs to be in check, constantly needs to be in check. Uh, however, we need to do it. Keep ourselves in check to make sure that we're Paul has a letter to the church in the, uh, to the church in Ephesus. If you turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four, verses one through three. Unity in the body of Christ. I was talking to the church here. Okay, you gotta be unified. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I think there's one word in there that hurts a lot of people. At least it does mean being patient. A lot of us are patient people. If you are patient, there's other things that, that uh, you know, that, that are you're struggling with. Being humble, being gentle. A lot of times we're not humble. We're all about us. And that completely pulls away the unity. Completely pulls away the unity. As uh, Paul talks you know, back in Philippians, he's saying, have the same attitude of Christ. Don't look at your own interests. Look at the interests of others. Be unified. See, this theme just pops up and pops up and pops up. Because unity is important. Church unity is huge. It's big. Paul encourages here the believers in Ephesus to be humble and gentle toward one another. Often we're not. Often, I'm not saying we never are, but there's times when Satan gets in there, pulls us apart, and we're, we're at each other. It's not a pretty picture. It pulls the beauty of unity out of it. He tells them to be patient and bear with one another. Why? Because he knows that getting along sometimes it just doesn't happen. It happens. You have that in your family. It's not just church, it's in the families. And I have heard so many stories throughout uh, my years of friends and different fam families of the fights that go on with people. I mean, somebody gets selfish, and boy, it, it doesn't take much, does it? And boom, the fight begins, right? And you hear about it. That's, the, that, that's this unity. Not only church, but in families, too. It happens. People get selfish, and they think about only what they want. And all it does is destroy people. It destroys Relationships, and that's not what God wants. So, where's your effort? Where's my effort? Where's our effort? We're all in this journey together. Are we striving and dedicating ourselves to pray for the church and others who don't know Christ? Are we? If we take a good long look at ourselves, we will see the things that need to change. None of us are perfect. <laughs> None of us. If you're perfect, please raise your hand because I want to get to know you and learn from you. <laughs> Or I've heard the saying, uh, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go in because you'll mess it up. <laughs> There's no perfect church. There's no perfect church. But we can be unified. We can. If we work hard at it and if we love one another. None of us are perfect, like I said. But it's what's amazing is even through our imperfections, God uses that somehow. I don't know how he does it. That's an amazing work of God. God uses us despite our imperfections and does awesome things through. Our weaknesses, our troubles, our frustrations, of course, and he uses those in some way. Teaches us, helps us, shows us he loves us. God's work is amazing. Let's ask ourselves this question every day. Where is my effort in contributing to praying and striving to stay unified? Where is my effort in it? Am I putting the effort in it? Jesus makes this very important to the disciples as he teaches them and encourages them to prayerfully stay strong and strive for unity. <clears throat> and Paul, you know, Paul says in verse 3 here, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the of peace. Every effort. That's what we have a problem with, is effort. We don't put the effort in. We get lazy. We get selfish. We get into our own world, and the effort is gone. And then we wonder why we're not happy. Because we're not putting in our part. We're hoping somebody else will do it for us. That's not going to happen. <laughs> you ever have somebody do a job for you? Well, if you always have somebody do a job for you, you're never going to get it finished. We all have a part in it. We all have a part in encouraging and keeping the bond. Don't give up when, the, when, when it gets tough. It's easy to give up when it gets tough. All of us feel like giving up from time to time. But Paul encourages us to make every effort. Keep in there. Press it hard. When the enemy strikes, don't fall down. Well, we may fall down, but get back up. God will help you get back up. To keep unified, we must remember to focus on loving one another. That's huge. Loving one another. And it's what Jesus was passionate about praying for us. Loving one another so that the world will see your love. Like we talked about last week, being the salt and the light. How can we be the salt and the light of the world if we're not being unified with one another? It's not going to happen. And the world's going to see us fighting a bigger. Well, I don't want to be part of that. You say God's loving, but you're not even loving each other. The church needs to be unified. Love, love, love. 
Love, love, love. Love has been is talked about also all throughout Scripture. And Paul, even to the church in Corinth, he sets out a chapter, the love chapter. We've talked about that. Where we need to do things in love, or else it's meaningless. We need to do things in love. We talked about the past month how it is, how important it is to love beyond the walls, but also to love within the walls of the church. And I think it's hard to love out, outside the walls when we're not loving each other here and being unified as a body. It's important. And Paul tells us it's important. Everything we need to do, everything that we do needs to be centered around our love for God. And you turn with me to the book of Colossians. We do a lot of the words of Paul this morning. But they're encouraging words. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. He's talking about rules for holy living. He has quite a mouthful here to encourage the church with, but also encourage us with. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Fourteen is amazing. And over all these virtues, love. Love, that's what brings it together when we're loving each other. Yeah, we're different. Yeah, we're like this. Yeah, we're like that. It's just bring it together. Bring it together. You're like a team. You see a coach bring a team. Bring it together. Come on, come on. Don't get frustrated. Come on, bring it together. We're a team here. That's what God wants us to be. His team. His ambassadors to go out there and preach His good news. To minister to others. That's why we need to be unified. Paul knew that getting in along in the church would be tough. He knew that. He was seeing that all over. But if we think about Jesus' prayer for all the believers, He prays for there to be unity so that the world will see the love of God through us. And the world desperately needs to see that love. Desperately. Not just talking about it. Talking is easy, but living it out is really challenging every single day of our lives. And verse 14, like I said, Paul drives it home. Put on love. You've got to love. And everything you do has got to be love. Even if you don't get along with the person. Oh, that's hard. Yeah, it is. But Jesus said to love. Paul said to love. It's important. It's imperative that we love despite our differences. When Jesus prayed for the new believers, he was passionate about that love being in us, about him being in our hearts, Jesus living within us, us living in God, being unified. God has given us a great mission to not only love each other within the body, but to take that love to a lost world. That's our mission. It's our greatest mission. Jesus sent the disciples out on the Great Commission. He sends us out to love people. Teach them. Help them. Today, I ask each of us to consider where our hearts really are. What we're struggling with. Are we so much focused on our own lives that we've completely missed God's call for us to love each other and be unified? Are we so stuck in our own worlds that we're missing that? Have we forgotten our mission to love those who are in Christ? Maybe not so much forgotten, but just distracted. We're distracted a lot. Let's focus on being unified in Christ. So does he pray for us to have a better effort in striving to be unified? We can be unified. And in that being unified, we can go out to people who don't know him and share that love in our jobs, in our families, with our friendships, every opportunity that we have. Church, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for you to get along sometimes and work together. But when we let God be in control, amazing and awesome things happen. Jesus, pray for our unity, our complete unity, and I hope that that is the passion of all of our hearts. Would you pray with me?